as we get going here as I can. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. We're thrilled to have so many of you with us on this very warm Thursday afternoon. So we hope that you're staying cool wherever you're watching our presentation today. Um, my name is Rebecca Banas. For those of you that don't know me, I am the new Director of Outreach, Marketing, and Events at Wild Care, and I am thrilled to be a part of Stephanie's amazing team. She's going to get started in just a second, but I am here to remind you that we will be doing these talks for the next couple of weeks. If you haven't signed up for next week's, it's going to be fantastic. Stephanie is going to be educating us on preventing wildlife casualties. That'll be um, a lot of anti-rodenticide, so if you're looking for some creative solutions to coexist and not hurt our wild neighbor as well, sort of keeping them at bay, but maybe learning a little bit more about what not to use and what you could use. That would be a great talk for you to join us with. You can email me, same email that you RSVP'd for this talk. Um, it's events at wildcarecapecod.org and I will happily send you a Zoom link for that talk as well. Um, a couple more people joining us. As a reminder, Wild Care pretty much survives by donations only. So we are doing these talks free of charge. That said, if you have a little extra, every $5 helps us save our wild neighbors here on the Cape and contribute to a healthy, very balanced environment that we can all enjoy. So if you do have a little extra and you're willing to share it with us, you can donate anytime, 24 hours a day, seven days a week on our website. And that website is wildcarecapecod.org. And it looks like we have a fair amount of people signed in. So without further ado, here's our Executive Director, Stephanie Ellis. Thank you, Rebecca. And hello, everyone. I am going to share my screen. Okay, Rebecca, can everyone see this? Okay, I'm so glad you all joined me. I hope you're all indoors with AC um, for the hottest day of the year so far. And we are going to talk about attracting some native songbirds to your backyard. And so everyone has their favorite birds and birds that they hope to attract. So if there's a bird I don't cover and you're interested in, um, you are welcome to type messages into the chat function. And then at the end of this presentation, I will answer all of the questions. So this is a female Northern Cardinal. Um, and I just have a quick few slides about wild care and who we are, because sometimes we have people joining us from other countries. Um, so wild care is a nonprofit wildlife rehabilitation center. And our goal is to treat um, injured, orphaned, and sick wildlife for release back into the wild. So we basically provide veterinary care and rehabilitation and get these animals back out the door. We are a nonprofit organization, 501c3, and we see over 1,800 animals per year. And that's pretty incredible in, um, considering that I have a staff of eight um, and four of those people are permanent um, animal care persons. So you can imagine taking care of 1,800 animals with four animal care staff is a tremendous feat. And so we are very dependent on volunteers if anyone would like to volunteer. Well, care also offer, operates an emergency helpline. And so this is a helpline where um, people can call us with questions or if you have an animal that is in distress you can call us and we provide live counseling and last year this helpline took in just under 10,000 phone calls which is incredible um, and to me speaks volumes to the fact that the service that we provide is a very important one on Cape Cod. This is a red-throated loon by the way being released and here it is swimming off. And our facility, it's the big yellow farmhouse that's located on the Orleans Rotary on the East Ham side. So if you pass um, the big yellow farmhouse on the Rotary, you should not give us a honk because you don't want to scare the animals inside <laughs> and the staff, but give us a wave. Um, this is the house that you can see from the Rotary. This is uh, heading into East Ham. And this here is a very large raptor aviary which is extremely important to our work uh, because it's the largest in the state 
So we can actually uh, legally house bald eagles in this facility, which we have. Uh, we rehabbed two juvenile bald, bald eagles last August. Um, but also, this building is so big that it has an outer chamber that forms a loop. So I call it the raptor treadmill. As you can see here, we have a red-tailed hawk flying. Um, and because they can make continuous circular flight, it's more true to life and gets them conditioned better to be released back in the wild. So it's a very important building for us. Um, it also has three inner av aviaries, so four aviaries in one. And just a couple more slides about us. Uh, we also have state-of-the-art seabird therapy pools which I refer to as the day spa for wildlife. I feel like sometimes the, the ducks and the geese and um, the seabirds that come through the doors probably don't want to leave. Um, these pools are incredible. When you think about where we are located, we're surrounded by water. So we see several hundred aquatic birds throughout the course of a year. And so all of these birds need to be waterproof and conditioned before they're released back into the wild. And the animals um, that we receive at Wild Care are largely birds, but we also take in small mammals. Um, so mammals up to the size of an opossum, we can accommodate at Wild Care. Any of the larger animals, um, raccoons, opossums, um, not opossum, I'm sorry, raccoons, skunks, otters, we refer those animals to the Cape Wildlife Center, which is in Barnstable. We do treat opossums at our facility. And last year we received 1,865 animals representing 121 species. And we even received a couple of monarch butterflies. So if you can imagine 121 species and having to have a really solid understanding of their dietary needs and their behavioral needs and to meet their needs, um, it is um, a very important job for us and something I feel like we do well, even for butterflies. And my last slide about wild care is just a reminder that um, a lot of the animals we see have been impacted by people in a negative way. And that's either direct or indirect. So almost half the animals we see each year are impacted because of people. And the top three reasons we see um, animals come in is because of cat and dog attacks, hit by vehicle or equipment, and then nest or habitat disturbed. And I'm mentioning all these points because at the end, I'm going to provide some tips for how you can all uh, mitigate these impacts and coexist with wildlife. Okay, so let's get to the topic. Um, so first of all, the reason this is called the pandemic edition, <laughs> attracting native birds, is because I don't know if you all know that with COVID and with the quarantine, bird watching and bird food sales and everything bird bird related just went through the roof skyrocketed especially people were stuck at home march and april and i actually wrote some information down because i thought it was fascinating national audubon society you all know national audubon they have a bird identification app and they found that in march and april that um, people downloading the app actually doubled compared with the previous year and visits to their website this March and April went up by a half a million people. That's a half a million more people who are now learning about birds, mostly because they got nothing to do, um, but they're beginning to explore their backyard and um, explore and enjoy nature. Um, and also the Merlin, if any of you use the Merlin Bird ID app, um, their downloads went up 102% from the previous year. And there was actually a bird food shortage at one point. Um, suet was hard to find. I was one of those people who was calling around and trying to order online, trying to find suet for my birds. Um, and when we talk about bird supplies, I, my most favorite place is Birdwatcher's General Store in Orleans. And Mike O'Connor, um, he has been terrific in that he has kept his doors open and done curbside through this whole pandemic. So you can get whatever you need for Mike. And I am not endorsed by Mike. I just, he is very good to us. He donates a lot of supplies. And so I always love to try to um, bring, bir bring birds, bring birders and bird people to his stores. 
Okay, so when attracting um, birds to your backyard, um, something that you can do that is very beneficial long term for birds is to plant um, a native garden. And this can be large scale, this can be acres, or this could be your deck, potted plants. My favorite source is Audubon's Native Plant Database. Um, this database is awesome. Um, if you just Google Audubon Native Plants, you can actually type in your zip code and then it will tell you what type of plants are native to your area. And it takes it even one step further where it tells you what types of birds are attracted to those plants. Um, so I highly recommend and when you're planting, I can't remember if I, I don't have a slide for it, but when you're planting, you want to consider planting things that provide food, shade, um, safety, nest spots. So you can have food that flowers one part of the year and provides nectar, pollen, has berries another part of the year. So the idea is to make it a diverse habitat that suits the needs of many different species throughout the year. And I'm sorry I'm not more being more specific. It's just that you could give entire presentations just on the plants. Um, so I recommend going to this database for a start. And now let's talk about some of the birds that everyone wants in their backyard. And so we are, you know, we're getting towards the end of the songbird season for some of these birds, especially Orioles, because they are migratory. They're going to be leaving soon, which makes me so sad. I hate to see them leave, um, but you can still enjoy them now while they're here and then prepare to attract them next year. So this beautiful bird that everyone wants in their backyard, they favor open woodlands and edges. Um, and so, you know, if you live in the middle of the city, you might not be able to attract them, but certainly if you live on the edge of a park um, and they are incredibly attracted to the grape jelly. They, they are hooked on the grape jelly. And there's a lot of controversy about that, okay? But I personally believe that we like to all think that the birds we see are only coming to our house, okay? And that is not true. They're eating from various different places. They're getting what they need. And so even though they're, you know, pigging out on the jelly, that is not the only thing that they're eating. If it was the only thing they were eating, I would be concerned but you can attract them with grape jelly and also um, feeders where you can provide orange slices. They love oranges. I can tell you that at my house, they eat out of um, small, I have a small bowl with chopped peanut suet and hulled sunflower and they eat that. And they're pretty bold. Uh, you know, they'll come close to the house. They're not typically a bird feeder bird. Um, I say this and, you know, they land on my, I have a little window feeder with suction cups. They do land in it and feed out of it, but they're not really the kind of bird that you see often landing from like a tubular feeder. Platform feeders are their favorite, where you can, um, where they can sit and perch. And if you go to any of the bird stores, you'll find numerous feeders where you can um, hang oranges for them. Orioles are important because they are caterpillar eaters and they are one of the few species that actually consumes gypsy moth caterpillars. And the reason is um, most birds find gypsy moth caterpillars to be completely um, distasteful and that's because they are spiny and toxic, um, but the orioles actually wipe the spines off of the caterpillars and then consume them. So we need more orioles around. <laughs> to take care of the gypsy moth caterpillar problem. So these birds are, arrive early May and leave in July. And when you have a family, they'll bring all their babies to your yard, which is really fantastic. Okay, so cedar waxwings. Everyone wants to attract cedar waxwings to their backyard, but they really are not a bird feeder bird. Even here, I've got, I feel like I have every bird in Orleans at my house, but I don't have cedar waxwings coming. And it's because um, what they're attracted to are open, open woodlands and fruiting trees and orchards. So they actually will eat petals of certain fruiting trees. They love fruit. If you plant trees that will fruit throughout the summer and the fall, and 
fruit that persists into the winter, that is how you are going to get cedar waxwings. In the winter here, they become nomadic, which means um, they're not truly migratory, but they will travel the countryside in search, in search of food. And what they're looking for in the winter with no insects is fruit. And they survive on things like rose hips and honestly a lot of non-native species with fruits that persist. Um, so one way also people can sometimes get them to their yards in the winter with the heated bird baths um, and possibly a platform feeder with um, suet, chopped suet, berries, insects. They have a really buzzy high pitched call that is so recognizable. I want everyone to look it up because then you'll know when they're flying by. And people tell me that they always know when their hearing is starting to go because they can no longer hear the cedar wax wings. It's a really high pitched buzzy call. Okay, so the Northern Cardinal, perhaps the United States most beloved backyard bird, abundant throughout the United States because of bird feeders, which has enabled them to survive during winters um, and their populations have spread. Everyone loves them. They absolutely adore safflower, sunflower, they'll eat peanuts. I have them here and they will eat from tube feeders, platform feeders, window feeders. And when I say window feeder, I mean, um, I have one of those feeders. It's about this big, little suction cups that go on the window. And I actually have these guys eating out of the window. Great birds to have around because they eat a ton of insects. And also they eat a ton of weed seeds. So if you can leave your gardens, let your gardens go to seed at the end of the summer. There are so many birds who are attracted to that. And I know your garden might look unsightly, but wait until, you know, wait till, until they forage through it and, um, and then before you clear cut it. So it's easy to attract these birds and they'll nest in low shrubs near your house. They like to nest in cedar trees, um, dense, dense shrubs, vines, low trees. Okay, here's a bird that I don't have at my house in Orleans that I have always wanted to and they are absolutely abundant. Um, they are the house finch. And they're such a beautiful little bird. The males are that beautiful, have that red head and breast. They have a delightful song. Um, they're a native species, uh, actually, not entirely na native species, okay? Because I have here, it says Hollywood finches. They're actually from Southern California. Um, and in don't quote me on this, but I think it was somewhere around the 20s. Um, these birds had been being sold as um, called Hollywood finches or redheaded linnets. Their song was so pretty, they were being sold as captive birds, caged birds. And as the story goes, there were some for sale here in New York at a pet store. There was a confiscation and hundreds of these little birds were released. Um, I personally, I'm glad that happened because they're not an aggressive species um, and they are abundant because of bird feeders, which have allowed them, like the cardinals, to survive throughout the winters and increase their populations. Bergarious and social, everywhere, they're everywhere. If you're in a flat in Boston, you can get them on your, on your deck. Um, they love the tube feeders. They love the thistle. That is their absolute favorite. Thistle and finch mix. They will also eat um, sunflower hulled or shelled. They love the weed seeds. So your gardens at the end of the summer. Um, and they also love, it's our favorite bird to nest in hanging plants. Um, they love hanging. Anytime people call us and say, there's a bird in our hanging plant. It's either a house finch or a Carolina wren. Favorite safe spot. They'll also nest on right on doors and wreaths. So if you leave your Christmas wreath up all year, you might get a house finch visitor. <laughs> really sweet little birds. So here's a relative of the house finch, the American goldfinch. Um, this is such a beautiful, beautiful little bird. And they have a pretty song. Um, then they have an undulating flight. So they fly and they dip. And when they fly, they say potato chip, potato chip, potato chip, potato chip. 
which is why it's listed there. But they're not really looking for potato chips because what they're really looking for is the thistle. These birds love thistle. Thistle's a, a very important part of their diet. In fact, at Wild Care, you know, we get all these baby birds from June through August. Um, goldfinches are the last baby birds of the season that we see. And that's because their breeding directly corresponds with the production of thistle because they use the thistle down to line their nests and they feed the thistle to the young. It's a staple part of their diet. So um, all the thistles that you see, you see thistles often in open woods, wasteland areas. Um, please leave it, don't spray it because these birds really need it. To us, they are the light, the beacon of hope that the baby bird season is coming to an end. When we see the goldfinches, <laughs> I hate to say that, they're beautiful babies. They're super demanding. They never stop begging. Um, so the black-capped chickadees, also abundant and probably the easiest birds to attract to your backyard. Um, they favor mixed forests, but honestly, they're, they're everywhere. Um, you know, edges of parking lots and they love suet sunflower and peanuts. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention, I'm supposed to mention what everyone likes to eat from. The American goldfinches love to eat from the tube feeders, especially thistle tube feeders, and they'll also eat from the sock thistle feeders, but they will um, sit on basically any of the um, any type of like box feeder or um, tube feeder. I get American goldfinches in my window on my little window feeder, but they really do prefer thistle and in a tube feeder. Okay, so the chickadees, you can attract them to your yard with suet, sunflower, peanuts, um, they'll eat safflower, they'll eat everything. And these guys, they, they're so interesting because they're so approachable, they, they don't seem to have much of a fear of people. Um, so you can get very close to them and watch their um, behavior and lives. Um, they are a year-round resident here. They roost and nest in cavities. So this is a bird that responds well to nest boxes, which we will talk about. Um, Cornell has a wonderful, wonderful site. If you just Google Cornell Nest Watch, they have this page called um, right bird, right house. And you can put in your region and it will tell you the types of cavity nesters you can attract and what they need. So you can buy it or build it. Um, nest boxes are so accessible and inexpensive these days. Um, so they generally nest in wooded areas and sometimes 60 foot high. What's interesting about these birds is they're really intelligent and they're master cachers. So they will store food in various locations and unlike squirrels, they actually remember where they stored everything. So if someone else doesn't get to it first, they will have it there for, you know, rough winter weather or storms. They're so tiny and so intelligent. And it's one of the few birds that will actually come down and pluck fur right off your dog's back. Um, to use to line their nests. This was a photo from um, Peter Trull's wife, Carol, in Brewster, a little chickadee pulling her hair out for a nest. <laughs> I guess he thought it was perfect nesting material. Oh yes, yeah, so here, here's the site. Um, Cornell, all about bird houses, right bird, right house. And see how you can select your region, select your habitat, and it will give you everything. It will give you um, instructions for building or tell you what you need. Um, so a close relative of the chickadee is the titmouse. They favor, um, they favor deciduous woods. You can find them in suburbs. They love tall trees. They also will nest in juniper and dense shrubs. They love sunflower, suet, and insects. So I do see chickadees and tit mice hanging off my suet cage. 
these tiny little birds and chomping away at it. But I also offer it in the window feeder, in the little tray, and in a cup as chopped suet. I use the peanut chopped suet mixed with hulled sunflower, and they absolutely love it. Caterpillars are their most important prey. So again, another important species here. They don't eat gypsy moths, but they eat the smaller caterpillars and eat a lot of things that are considered pests. Um, they will travel in, in flocks uh, when they're not breeding. They're very gregarious when not breeding. Also a cavity nester. They do respond to nest boxes. And here's another one who will pluck hair even from humans. And I wrote something here that it's important. Um, they, a lot of these birds, they do not excavate on their own. And there's a real lack of dead trees, dead and open cavities. And there's a lot of um, competition from other species for these little birds. So here's how nest boxes can really, really help. This little bird will also eat from, um, they'll take from tube feeders, or your regular haying feeders, or window feeders, or platform feeders. They're not so picky. Uh oh. My presentation went away for a second. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so the nut hatches. We are so fortunate that Cape Cod, Cape Cod does have um, a lot of forest remaining. It's not all connected, unfortunately, um, but we do have lots of trees in this beautiful place. And so what the nuthatches love is lots of trees. So these two species, the one on the left is the white-breasted nuthatch. They're here year round. Um, they prefer a mixed woodland. Okay, and when I say mixed woodland, I mean the deciduous trees and the cone-bearing uh, trees. But you can also find these guys on the, in groves, woodlots, edges, parks, as long as trees are present. They love sunflower, peanuts, and suet. And I'm sure you know the white-breasted nuthatch, that's the bird that climbs the tree, um, you know, going head first. It's really the only bird that we see doing this. And so they're tree huggers and they eat a lot of insects and a lot of seeds. Um, the little one on the right is the red-breasted nuthatch. We also have them year-round. I will tell you that I have a dense population of red-breasted nuthatches in the winter because I live on Baker's Pond and it's, um, it's heavily wooded and it's largely uh, conifers, cone-bearing trees. However, they disappear in the summer and I don't know why that is or where they go. I miss them every summer, but they'll be back in the fall. So again, not picky. These guys eat out of um, tube feeders, regular feeders, platform feeders, suet cages, window feeders. <laughs> and I hope this helps. And if you go to bird watchers or look online, you'll see many different types of bird feeders. So woodpecker bonanza. We have a lot of woodpeckers on Cape Cod. Um, there's four common species. One of them I did not um, feature here, but it's the hairy woodpecker, who looks like a downy, but is much larger. Um, so woodpeckers, they do excavate their own nests. However, there is enormous competition for them with squirrels and invasive species <clears throat> like European starlings. And so it's, it's a kind, a wonderful thing you can do is to put up a next nest box to attract woodpeckers. Can't talk. Um, so the woodpeckers, it's interesting. The downy woodpecker, the hairy woodpecker, and the red belly that's here, they all love, they'll hang on the suet, they'll eat from trays, they love sunflower, peanuts, they'll eat from your window. Um, the flicker, this is interesting. It's a woodpecker, but not in your traditional sense because they love to forage on the ground. Um, and that's because their favorite food on this planet is um, ants. Um, and so they will come to suet and all those bird feeders that I just mentioned, um, but they're a little more shy and you don't see them as commonly um, at your backyard feeding stations. I have them here and they've actually brought their babies 
but I also live, I think, in a unique situation where I'm, I'm on the second floor in the woods, and it's a habitat. I'm in their canopy, basically, so they feel very comfortable. Um, but don't get discouraged. They will also eat oranges, and they're great for keeping your ant populations down in your backyard. Um, all these birds eat, you know, they eat insects, galls, they eat berries. There's so many things to say about them. <laughs> um, nest boxes for sure. So the American Robin. I love this photo and most of these photos are from a dear friend and supporter, Susan Wellington. Uh, this is a dad Robin feeding its nestlings. And Robin's, you know, also not a backyard bird feeder bird. Um, they are abundant and widespread. They really do prefer orchards, uh, lawns, farmland. Um, they're not generally found in dense forests, but you can find them in cities, you know, in your parks. And they are a ground feeder. Uh, they are foraging on earthworms, so please no pesticides, no harmful um, organophosphate type pesticides because that affects them in that the insects concentrate it, the birds eat it, and the birds get poisoned. These birds, um, one way to attract them to your yard is very much like the cedar waxwings. They love fruit, so to plant fruit-bearing trees that will fruit throughout the year, that will bring them to your yard and they might even decide to nest there. They also love shelves. They're not cavity nesters, but they will tuck under a shelf. See how this bird is tucked into a picket fence? Often anything with an overhang, it could even be the side of your porch, that is what they're attracted to. So it's, it's hard to attract them per se, but if they find a structure on your house or barn, that they find desirable, they'll nest there. Um, I have finally attracted robins to my second floor deck, which is extraordinary. And I did that by putting in a heated bird bath. This is one way, heated bird baths. Last year was a mild winter, but you know, we can have some pretty harsh winters. And Eastern bluebirds, American robins, and cedar waxwings are attracted to heated bird baths. So I think ultimately what attracted them was, um, well, all my birds coming around, so they know something's up. The heated bird bath, and then they started eating from a platform tray, um, chopped suet, chopped into tiny little pieces. <laughs> and now they come back. I haven't seen them in a little while because there's so much activity here. I think it, they're rather shy around all these other birds, um, but they, they loved that. You could put mealworms out for them. And this goes right into Eastern Bluebird. Um, Eastern Bluebirds love a heated bird bath. This, like the robin, they are not a backyard bird feeder bird. You're not going to see them on your, um, well, I shouldn't say that actually. You might see them on your bird feeders because birds do weird things, but they prefer platform feeders. So, when I say platform, I mean basically, honestly, it could be a tray on a table, but they sell platforms that you can put on top of a post um, or can hang. They love platform feeders. They will eat dried mealworms, live mealworms, berries, chopped fruit, chopped suet. Um, and once they find a place to eat, they will come back and come back. And in the winter, if you're lucky, They'll bring all their nomadic friends and maybe you'll get a flock of waxwings and robins and bluebirds to your backyard. These guys, they really do favor a special habitat and that is open country. Scattered trees, roadsides, fences where they can perch and look for bugs. Um, and then they tend to nest in those habitats. So if you live in that type of habitat, set up a nest box. Um, you know, there are people in East Ham who have bluebirds in their backyard because they have enough open space that the birds are there. Okay, I love this. Is this not everyone's favorite? <laughs> um, the feathered jewels. So these little birds are just migratory marvels. Uh, they arrive here in late April usually, and there's actually, if you look up hummingbird migration, there is a hummingbird migration map 
So in April, when you're anxiously awaiting their arrival, you can look on the map and see where they are. Um, so I always look at that and I start putting, I usually put my um, sugar water out uh, mid-April. So important about hummingbirds, they do not need red dye. Most of the hummingbird feeders have red on them. And so the birds are attracted to that. The red dye um, is thought to be harmful to developing feathers and it's completely unnecessary. So I recommend just making your own sugar water by uh, boiling water and then it's one part sugar to four parts water. And then I mix that up really well, let it cool, you refrigerate it. And importantly, on hot days like today, you're gonna wanna change that bird food every two days because it gets, I'm sure you've seen it when you, when you open it, it's slimy inside, um, it's gonna get rancid, it's going to get moldy, and that is when, yes, <laughs> the birds are gonna run into bacterial fungal issues directly as a result of your dirty bird feeders. So please clean those bird feeders often, especially now. Um, and cleaning them, you can use like a one to 10 solution of um, bleach to water. And if you go on the internet or go to that native plant guide for Audubon, there's a gazillion native plants that these guys love. Um, and they pretty much love any flower that's tubular that they can get their beak into and bright colorful flowers will attract them. My favorite thing for attracting them is I have the, what's called a jewel box here, jewel box window feeder. It's a window feeder that looks like a little jewelry box where the top opens up, suction cup to, to your window, and they eat right out of my window, which is incredible because I get to see their, I get to see their lives up close. I also have to tell you that um, I raise all of the baby hummingbirds on Cape Cod, which is not many. I usually only get about four a year, and that's enough because <laughs> they're a lot of work. Um, but I absolutely love them, and I fill my deck with flowers because all of the babies are released here. It's called a soft release where I get them used to the habitat, and they see where the other hummingbirds are going, and then I release them. So it's pretty incredible. I expect to have baby hummingbirds any day now. I haven't seen any at the feeder, but I know they're here. Um, and by the way, it, with the hummingbirds, the dad is a total deadbeat um, because he does not have any involvement in the care of the young. As soon as she lays that second egg, he is out of there. So it's just mom. Um, <laughs> and I think it goes without saying, if you Google hummingbird feeders, there's so many different types. I like the plastic ones because I'm always worried about um, the glass ones falling and breaking, but glass is easier to clean. It doesn't crack. And so I've given you some points on how to attract some different types of birds to your backyard. And one thing you should be aware of is when you have a ton of birds coming to your backyard feeders, um, you're also going to probably have one of these. So this is an adult Cooper's hawk. Beautiful, beautiful bird. This bird thinks that your backyard feeders are a buffet for him. Um, and there's really nothing you can do about that except make sure you provide your birds with lots of cover. So um, bushes, trees in the yard they can escape into, even a brush pile. I know it seems unsightly, but you'll see birds dive into the brush pile to take cover when there's nothing else around. So this is Mr. Cooper's hawk. He's a bird eater, also called um, like a sparrow hawk or a chicken hawk. And the other cool thing about bird feeding is um, that you can expect the unexpected. So sometimes, you know, you set up a nest box and you set it up for fly catchers and you might have a squirrel in the nest box. Um, or you might set something up for chickadees and find that you have tit mice in the nest box. So you can also expect when there's bird seed, squirrels, vagrant species, birds that are mi migrant and have lost their way related to storms or because they're young, they might show up at your door. 
um, snakes, mice, turkeys, and of course rats. And if you want to talk about rats, you should join my presentation next Thursday, where we're going to talk about deterring rats and mice from your backyard. But anyway, I want to show you this video um, where I live. I've got birds all day long. It's like Logan International Airport for birds. Um, and then at night, my bird feeders are filled with these little guys. And I don't know if you can, Rebecca, can you see it? So this is a southern flying squirrel, and I have about 15 of them at my house. I have a very healthy population of flying squirrels. <laughs> so whatever the birds don't eat throughout the day, these guys clean up, which kind of makes me happy because honestly, then there's nothing left on the ground for any, for rats or anything. Um, but this is something you can expect. They really do favor, they need a dense woodland and they like um, a mixed forest because these are a gliding species. So they need consecutive trees to be able to glide to. So they glide from tree to tree, to my window, to my sewer feeder, to the trees. They're absolutely wonderful. <laughs> okay, so um, my last slides now are just some ways that you can not only attract but coexist with birds because I was saying earlier that um, you know almost 45 percent of the animals we receive have been impacted by people and if you watch this presentation I know that you all care about birds because you want them in your backyard um, so here here's some tips um, to help you keep birds safe and for one um, save a tree save an owl or save a woodpecker, or save a, um, a titmouse, uh, because trees are never really dead. And people always say, you know, you have this dead snag in your backyard and it looks unsightly. But honestly, even if there's not a bird living in it, there's probably thousands of insects in it that other animals are feeding on. So if you can keep um, dead snags and logs in place, please do. But also, most importantly, save your tree felling and pruning for late fall. Because, you know, if you were to cut down trees right now, there are babies everywhere. Squirrels are about to have their second litters, um, or, they're, or they're having their second litters. Um, birds that are not migratory are working on their third clutch of the season. Um, so everything is filled with life right now. And here's another slide. I apologize for this graphic slide, but it's so important. Um, keeping your cats indoors, especially you bird feeders. You know, I feel like having a big backyard bird feeding station and then having your cat outdoors, those two things don't really go hand in hand because now you're creating a buffet for your cats. Um, and so, it's known that cats are responsible for the death of over 2.4 billion birds annually in the United States alone. And that does not even account for, what about the reptiles, the amphibians, the small mammals, the beneficial insects. Um, and we all know that it is so much safer, not just for the wildlife, but safer for your cat to be indoors. So if you have an outdoor cat and it really wants to be outside, you can consider getting a catio, which is an indoor outdoor patio just for your cat. So he will have his own digs and feel like he's in the great outdoors, but he won't be able to kill anything. Um, and actually we have information about this listed on our website. Um, if you go to our website, it's under preventing wildlife. Rebecca, what is it called? Preventing I can't remember. I believe it's called Preventing Wildlife Casualties, but I will grab the link and add it to the chat. Okay, yes. She will grab the link and add it to the chat. Um, so it has information about buying or building a catio. And also there's something called a cat bib, that if your cat has to go outdoors, it's a bib that prevents the pouncing activity. It does not decrease mobility. They just, it, they pounce more slowly. And so the other, the animals can get away. 
Here's another graphic slide, but I'm happy to tell you that that bird survived and was released. Um, this was a bird, a casualty of a window strike. This is a northern perula, a type of migratory warbler. And window strikes are real and they're a huge problem in the United States. It's known that over a billion birds a year die from window strikes. And you're probably asking why? Like birds aren't stupid. And so why can't they see the windows? Then what happens is birds, um, they do not interpret um, glass as glass. What they see is the reflection of the landscape around it. And so they see the landscape and interpret that as a throughway. And so that's what happens. So what we need to do is to break up the reflection so that then the, the glass is interpreted as a structure. Uh, and there's a lot of ways you can do that. For one, you can keep your windows dirty. And then when your friends come over and complain about your dirty windows, you can say, it's for the birds, you guys. Stop complaining. There are also UV decals, which are, are brilliant. Um, they are these decals that you can barely see. They, birds can see them because birds can see in the near UV spectrum and it helps to break up that reflection. On the link that Rebecca is um, putting in the chat, American Bird Conservancy has a lot of information about bird films that you can put on your windows. And one of the easiest things you can do is take a glass writing pen in white and draw vertical lines four inches apart on the offending window. And we can barely see it and birds can see it. Um, so there are all these things. Most importantly, it's easy enough during spring and fall to turn off all your indoor and outdoor lights. Turn off any unnecessary lighting because what happens during spring and fall migration is birds are migrating and they're using a whole bunch of different visual cues and they use celestial cues. They're looking at the stars. And so it's believed that when birds see a bunch of light, they get disoriented. They start circling around this light. And then what happens is they become exhausted. They strike the building and they die. Um, and it's really unfortunate. And you see this in huge numbers in big cities with skyscrapers. But thank God there's more and more awareness about it. Um, and so there are some cities that actually during uh, the height of migration, people are required to turn out lights at high levels. This bird was released. He recovered. This was the spring. Um, he recovered and he was released the next day. Rodenticides. Uh, rodenticides are really harmful to our large predators, our raptors, our owls, our hawks, um, but also large mammal predators like coyotes and raccoons and foxes. Rodenticides I'm referring to the anticoagulant poisons that you can buy in the store like Decon. And what happens is people poison mice with them or rats. That mouse or rat is now debilitated and goes outside. And then Mr. Red-tailed Hawk here sees that easy prey debilitated mouse and eats it and becomes poisoned himself. Um, so we are going to talk next week in my Rodenticide talk about humane ways of deterring um, and controlling rodent populations. But rodenticides are not the answer because they kill the unintended. And so thank God this hawk actually survived. He was treated by us and survived and so did this great horned owl. Um, but I would say that over 90% of the raptors that we get have some level of rodenticide poisoning in their system. So they're eating tainted rodents and feeding them to their young. This is, this is an owl on a glue trap, um, which I also despise. Glue traps trap the unintended. This owl probably went in after a wiggling rodent who was trapped on the plate or wiggling insects. Um, they're really inhumane and I personally think they should be outlawed. Snap traps are far more humane than any of this. But I do hope you can attend my talk next week because the big focus is going to be rodenticides and deterrence. And I have a lot of options other than these. 
uh, get the lead out. It's important um, that people clean up their fishing debris and do not use lead for fishing or for hunting. Um, lead, lead shot was outlawed um, quite a few years ago for use in waterfowl hunting. However, it still litters our waterways. And so what happens is when you have a, a long necked bird like a swan or a goose, you know, and they tip and they dabble the bottom of a pond or a lake, they're ingesting the shot and getting poisoning. The loons, um, it's the number one threat to common loons in New England based on a study done by Tufts. These birds are ingesting fishing hooks, um, uh, excuse me, lead jigs, lead sinkers, lead lures, and then they get poisoned. But also lead, as we know, in, because it happens in people, it bioaccumulates. So lead is also in the fish that some of these animals are eating. It's a reminder to me always um, that we really need to pay attention to what's happening in these animals because it also impacts us. We're all very closely related. We're eating the same things that they are. We're swimming in the same places that they are. This loon on the right was a lucky one being released back out to sea. Um, but anyway, we say uh, to never consider lead. There are so lead. There's so many other alternatives to lead shot and um, lead tackle. The birdhouses we already talked about, but um, basically I think they're nature's best real estate investment. And even if you just um, live in a small place and just have a deck, you might be able to attract birds to your deck, especially birds like chickadees and titmice who are so friendly, approachable. Um, and like I said, there's a lack of natural cavities. And having all these animals around, great insect control. Having all these raptors around, is great um, rodent prey control. And if you want a nest box, I've listed all these places here where you can purchase them. But also don't forget to go to that Cornell Nest Watch page because it's awesome. Um, it will tell you everything you need to know. Because you know you can't just throw up a box with a hole in it. Birds prefer a certain size. Some boxes need to be facing the sun. Um, it's really not that, all, not that complicated but you'll have better chance, chances at attracting what you want if you, um, if you look up the species and find out what they need. So my last slides are just, um, I had promised in the description that I would tell you guys what to do if you find a baby bird, since you're now attracting all these birds to your backyard and setting up a habitat for them. So we get over 300 baby birds per season um, from people who find them. Either they've cut down a tree or their cat has brought the birds to them. And so I want to give you some advice on what to do if you find a baby bird. Uh, so these are American robins with their big tulip mouths and then there's a tiny little Phoebe in there tucked away. Because sometimes it's important to have friends even if they're not the same species. So if you find a baby bird on the ground, generally the season is May through August. As we get into August, we're gonna start getting those goldfinches, like I was saying. And by the way, cedar waxwings also nest late because I told you they're big berry eating birds and they love the tar tarian honeysuckle berries, which will start, I've noticed they're starting to form berries now. And so waxwings often nest late so they can feed the babies those. And by the way, the cedar waxwings, for those of you who know them, they have a gorgeous tail that is dipped. It looks like it's dipped in yellow ink. It's so beautiful. And the richness of that color is dependent on the Tartarian honeysuckle. So we can always tell which babies have been being fed honeysuckle by their parents. Um, by the color of that tail. It will be almost like a rich orange color. So beautiful. Anyway, if you find baby birds, give us a call. 240-2255 because we are going to ask you a bunch of questions. We are going to ask you if the baby bird is naked, blind, and helpless. Example A right here. 
he is naked, his eyes are still closed, and he's completely helpless and completely dependent on the parents for food and for warmth. So if you find that bird, if it's not injured, if you know exactly where the nest is, we will have you put the bird back in it and then have you watch for the parents. If you don't know where the nest is, we're going to have you bring the bird to us because there's no time for this little bird um, to be sitting in a nest waiting for parents. Uh, they need to come back in immediately, otherwise it will die because it can't stay warm and it can't feed itself. So we would ask you to get the bird warm and transport it to us. These little nestlings, they have a little bit more feathers. Notice their eyes are open, they're, they're bright alert, their mouths are open. With these guys, there's a little more time. If you find the nest on the ground, if you know where it came from, we'll probably have you put the nest in a basket or a bucket with drainage holes, hang it up where the nest was or very close to where the nest was, and then watch for the parents. If the parents don't come, um, we'll have you bring the birds to us. And then it's just so critical and we're happy. This is what we do when I said live counseling on the phone. This is what we do is work you, work it through with you um, so that you're not worrying and that you know that you're doing the right thing. The most troublesome baby bird calls that we get are this guy right here. And by the way, these are all American Robins. Um, this is the juvenile delinquent, the teenage American Robin who causes all the trouble because look at this bird he's like as big as an adult almost fully feathered and so people see this bird and say oh my god it's on the ground it's orphan you know i'm going to take it home and i'm going to feed it or i'm going to bring it to wild care but what most people don't know is that songbirds spend almost a week on the ground before they can actually fly most songbirds it's a very precarious part of their life. There's a huge mortality rate um, because these birds, every day their feathers are growing in. All their parents can do is feed them and alert them to safety. And every day they might get a little higher, a little higher into the, the trees. Oops. Um, so the kindest thing you can do, you know, if it's not injured is make sure the parents are feeding it. If you must touch it, um, put it in a low shrub so it's out of harm's way. The kindest thing you can do is keep your cats away, your dogs away, your children away. Watch for the parents. Mom and dad robins both care for the young. They're extraordinary parents. Um, and so, so each one you can see every scenario is different. Um, I mean, if a whole tree was cut down, sometimes we can put something up in place and hang it up and the parents will come. The fidelity to the young is so strong, but the young also have to be peeping so that the parents hear them, if that makes sense. Um, so it's good, you know, if, if a nest falls and we put it back and it's not exactly in the same place, but it's close, the parents can often hear the young and find them. Um, if they can't hear the young, they're not going to find them. I hope that makes sense. In my last slide, since you guys are attracting birds and you know how to reduce window strikes, is if a songbird strikes your window, this is a hermit thrush, by the way, beautiful, beautiful bird, struck a window, was with us for a few days and recovered. Um, if a bird strikes your window and it's sitting on your deck in a lump, I recommend that you put it into a shoe box with ventilation holes, Bring it inside, keep it away from your pets and your kids, and let it chill for like two hours. Don't peek, don't leave it in a, in a lump on your deck because a predator or a cat is gonna come and pick it up. Um, most of the time birds are just stunned, but sometimes they really cause damage, head trauma. So put it in that box two hours, and then take it outside, stand near a shrub so they have something to fly into, open the box. It will probably take two seconds to look around and fly away. If it doesn't, then there's probably a problem. Then it probably has head trauma, swelling, and needs to come to wild care so we can start some anti-inflammatories and fluids and keep the bird comfortable. Um, you can also call us or call your local rehabber 
because there are some rehabilitators who believe that all the birds should always be brought into a facility for care immediately. Um, but at Wild Care, we like to give it two hours because sometimes they truly are just stunned. All right, um, so I hope that you all, it was a lot of information and I wished I could have covered more songbirds, but I covered, um, I think the ones that are most common who everyone loves. Um, and just a reminder that, you know, I just gave you a bunch of tips on how we can all make a difference for wildlife. Uh, simple, simple things like keeping your windows dirty um, can make a difference for migratory birds and young birds. We are all ambassadors. And then just a reminder that we are a nonprofit, like Rebecca said, and we're doing this amazing, amazing work and we rely on people like you to make donations. So if you'd like to make a donation, you can visit our website, Wild Care Cape Cod, and make a donation there. Volunteers, as I mentioned, we always need volunteers, and we currently have four baby bird shifts open. The baby bird program requires a once per week, three hour commitment, where you come in and all you do is feed and clean baby birds. So if you're interested, Go to our website, wildcarecapecod.org. There's a big button that says volunteer and you can fill out the application right there. And we need you now because you all know that the goldfinches are coming. And we're gonna need your help with that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. I hope you learned a lot and um, I will see if anyone has any questions. Uh, yes, if anyone does have a question, they can add it to the little chat function. I just shared the wild resources link again. I'm also going to share um, for people that aren't familiar, Birdwatchers General Store. I just put their URL in the chat as well. Um, people are really just telling you that they're really enjoying it. Very enlightening. Thank you for the information. Um, yes, Tara, we are very blessed with bird life. <laughs> we are. And I hope I provided enough information about what types of feeders um, there is. I mean, you can, if you go online, you can Google it, or you can call Mike at the bird store and he'll tell you what type. I do want to add, uh, because a lot of people are new to bird feeding, people have reached out to me and have said, Oh my God, I don't want the grackles, you know, because the grackles are a larger bird. Um, they're a black bird. They will come, they will eat everything. And the answer to that is um, they don't really hull. They don't hull. Um, actually, I guess they do hull seeds. They're not crazy about safflower. They don't hull it or waste their time. Um, but they actually sell bird feeders where you can, it has a lever that closes and you can adjust the tension for the weight of the bird. So if you have a large bird like a grackle, you can adjust the tension so that it closes the feeder, not on him, but closes the ability for him to eat so that he can't get in. And my mother has had one for 20 years and no one's ever gotten their feet caught in it or anything. So, um, so those are really good. You know, if you had like a crow problem or some people have a pigeon problem. Pigeons are mostly ground feeders, but they will, you know, get, they will go up on big feeders. So I forgot to mention that in my presentation, but grackles do prefer stuff that they can swallow easily. Like they eat all, they eat my suet <laughs> in the whole sunflower. <laughs> um, Stephanie, we do have a question about window bird feeders. Um, do birds ever miss the feeder and hit the window or is the feeder pointing out to the bird sort of indicate to the bird that there's a window there? Um, that's interesting. I've had this little feeder now, which is literally about, it's this big, it's clear and has two suction cups and it's right in my kitchen window. Um, and I've never had anyone strike it, but I do also have those decals that I was telling you about the UV decals, they're shaped like make maple leaves. I do have those in that window, but I've been fortunate. The side of the feeder has two little wooden blocks that are green. So I think the birds can actually see, plus it's always filled with food. So I think they can actually see, like if it was just clear, 
um, I would think that might be a problem, but I think they can actually see that it's a structure because they have no plant problem. They land on it and in it and sometimes on top of it. So I hope that helps. And I've never had, I've had the jewel box in my window um, for several years and I've never had a strike there either. In fact, it might be, I hope it's all breaking up the reflection of the window. Um, and also I said migratory birds, that window strikes are especially problematic for them. They're, it's also problematic for baby birds. Because think about it, your, your backyard chickadee who's here year round, he figured out the windows, right? He's not stupid, but the baby birds who haven't explored their habitat yet, they are the ones hitting the windows right now. And I did add that link to the chat, um, but if anybody can't see it, if you go to our website, um, again, it's wildcarecapecod.org. If you just scroll about halfway down the homepage, you'll see there are links to our news and a lot of our resources for stuff like this can be found there. And there's a whole list that Stephanie put together of um, the Audubon's website, where you can find the UV, where you can find pens, um, the plant life, the catio links. So it's all sort of on there, just waiting for you. And we created a downloadable PDF if you want to be able to save that to one of your devices and, and look at it later for future reference. Does anybody else have any questions that I can pass on before we let you go? Lots of thank yous, Stephanie. People are saying they learned an awful lot. <laughs> Oh, good. I'm so glad. Thank you all. This is really fun. Stay cool, everyone. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. If you haven't signed up for next week's chat, it's going to be a very, very good one. Um, probably a little bit on the downer side to begin with, but we're going to end it on an upswing. So it's going to be a really, really good one. Lots of knowledge, some really important stuff to help keep the balance um, of nature and us here on the Cape and keeping our raptor friends healthy and happy. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Again, if anyone has a little extra, you can always donate on wildcarecapecod.org. And if you missed anything and you need some of those links, you can always email me. Again, my name is Rebecca, and my email is events at wildcarecapecod.org. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.